our only yeah. option. Okay, we are live. Um, I don't, well, uh, since we are, oh, we'll wait two minutes. How's that? We are live. We okay. are recording right now um, uh, and broadcasting. So um, we'll give it two minutes since I started a tiny bit early uh, to see if anybody joins us in the room. And then either way, we will get rolling in two minutes. Because I can see over there. I like, um, Jeff, I like your background. It, it really looks like you know a lot. <laughs> no, it just looks like I write down a lot. <laughs> it doesn't, you're assuming That's your wife's I whiteboard, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're assuming I understood any of the stuff I wrote down. Uh, well, no, it's not important. It just, you have to look <laughs> like you know something. It's, uh, it's just a like, lot of. Like Paul, Paul looks like he knows a lot. He does. Well, I was just thinking none of us have got bookcases behind us. That's usually the way of sort of signaling how erudite you are. Oh, you're right. You're right. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. There it is some books. literally behind me. Right. <laughs> okay. I guess, guys, in the interest of time, we will just start uh, since, again, they record these uh, for use later and for sharing for people on the site throughout the year. I think, Danny, just to be safe – uh, technically, we'll start with you. Um, for the first few minutes, it'd be great if the three of you just introduce yourselves. Tell a little bit about your background, uh, the relevant part of it. Um, and then maybe uh, what I don't want to do is get into the content yet. I'm more interested for the first go around between the three of you of explain who you are, your background and sort of, you know, how that got you here, i.e. what what you're in, you know, what you do in the in in terms of uh, economic research, uh, et cetera. So go ahead, Denny. Why don't you start us off by spending a few minutes about yourself, and then we'll go around and do that. Then we'll okay. dig into to open statements. All right. Well, I'm CEO of a company called Data Logical Services, and what we do is we provide – it's an IT production company. So if you need something done on the Internet or in the digital area – you come to us. We're a service provider and we're a solution provider. Uh, additionally, uh, we have 100,000 data scientists in a newly formed uh, craft union, global craft union, the first of its kind. So we have 100,000 data scientists at our beck and call. And as far as my background goes, well, that it's, it's spotty. Um, I was the first director of business and marketing intelligence for Pegatron out of Taiwan. And uh, I also worked with uh, the Russian Duma in Moscow to create um, reports and uh, procedures for cryptocurrency within the Russian economy. I am a financial mandate for the king and queen of Bhutan, which is strategically located between India and China. Not a bad place to be. And um, let's see what else uh, I want to tell you. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm also an introducer and um, given permission by Al Maktoum, the king of Dubai, uh, to open and operate a currency and commodity exchange. How's that? Is that okay? <laughs> That's, uh, I don't, Good I, you, picked the wrong, you picked the wrong adjective. Spotty wasn't it. Uh, interesting for sure. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Paul. Yes, yeah, Jeff. Um, so I'm uh, Australian by birth, also an American citizen now. Be, I'm a research fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. I've been there about three years now. Prior to that, I had uh, about a quarter of a century uh, in the financial markets. Uh, so I'm an economist uh, by training background. I was chief economist for <clears throat> Lehman Brothers, uh, Nomura Securities, uh, Standard and & Poor's and S&P Global, which is more or less the same company. Uh, and prior to that, sort of started out, well, I had five years on the buy side, had some buy side experience, sell side experience. Prior to that, um, uh, started off as an academic in Australia, uh, a little bit of time in the US and a lot of time in Japan. I lived in Japan, <clears throat> pardon me, for 17 years, speak Japanese, um, started out as a Japan economy uh, sort of specialist. Um, 
but you know the last 25 30 years i've been doing a lot of uh you know macro kind of stuff central bank watching policy watching what are the trends ups and downs in the global economy so that's kind of the prism through which uh i've been looking at this uh, this covid event which uh we can come to a little bit a little bit later but is you know is a pretty big macro event excellent uh thank you very much um uh, go ahead so my name is John Montgomery. I'm a recovering uh, Silicon Valley corporate lawyer. Um, I practiced um, startup company law in um, the Valley for 30 years. Um, I still have my license. I do a little bit of legal work. But uh, along the way, I, um, I woke up to the pitfalls of neoliberal economics and shareholder primacy. Um, and I, I kind of came at it from a performance perspective. You know, I, I, I love working with winning startup companies and uh, got deep into what are the characteristics of successful companies and so on and so forth. And one of the things that I noticed was that the way that the corporation is designed, you know, it's a, we essentially have 500 year old corporate architecture and corporations, you know, are, are engineered to conquer markets and exploit them. And, you know, it's, it, it's a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, under Delaware law, the sole legitimate purpose of the corporation is to maximize stockholder welfare. And my, my sense was that we have, um, uh, two moral uh, systems working simultaneously in the world. We have the, the essential golden rule, which in all of our various spiritual traditions as individuals were expected to follow. But once you get into the, the boardroom, the rule of gold takes over. You know, the, the moral compass of that corporation is to maximize stockholder welfare at the expense of society and the environment. And I, I kind of woke up and realized, wait a second, the corporation needs to have a conscience. And um, that I started pulling on that thread and I, I transitioned from rainmaker to change maker and have been working for the last 15 years trying to identify the sponsoring thoughts of guiding principles of our civilization and its economic system and uh, suggesting upgrades to those sponsoring thoughts and guiding principles so that we can create an economic system in a global civilization that's sustainable and regenerative and lives within the constraints of the biosphere. Excellent. Wow. I, I absolutely love yeah. that that's the sort of top-down approach uh, that you're taking to that. So here's where I'd like to start. Before, what we're going to do is talk about solutions, right? What things, what programs, what ideas, uh, uh, what actual tactics will accelerate economic recovery? But before we do that, I'd like you each to talk about, um, first, let's lay the groundwork. How bad is the problem? On a global basis, we're talking about economic recovery. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on how bad the problem is, how much and how deep and what do we have to recover from at this moment in history? So, uh, Paul, we'll just go around. Why don't you go first mm -hmm. and talk about what we have to recover from and, and how bad you think it is right now or not or how bad it yeah. is. Or Thanks, Jeff. Uh, well, as I said, I, I look at things you know, from a, a macroeconomist perspective. I look at the data. Um, you know, I've seen a few crises in my day. I mentioned I was the chief economist at Lehman Brothers uh, at the bitter end in uh, September 2008. But I spent uh, many years in Japan as well, and particularly in the 1990s, early 2000s, where Japan was recovering, <clears throat> pardon me, from its uh, bubble economy and went into deflation, etc. Um, but this, you know, just if you look at the numbers, this COVID shock which of course was a very different kind of macroeconomic shock, uh, a negative shock to aggregate demand um, and to supply to a certain extent, depending on how you look at it, was the really the biggest uh, you know, negative shock in recorded history. Um, you know, peak to trough, and this was compressed into two quarters, which is for really the first half of, of last year. GDP uh, in the US fell about 10%. 
In the euro area, it fell about 15%, and in the UK, it fell 22%. Non-annualized numbers, so roughly multiply by two to get an annualized number. <clears throat> um, we, we've never seen a, 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 a sudden and, and uh, such a big sudden fall in GDP ever. If you go back to the Great Depression, uh, it played out over a longer time period, although the peak to trough fall was bigger than it was in the US this time. Another statistic, you know, to bring it back to, to people's lives, uh, in just two months, February to April of last year, the unemployment rate, simple unemployment rate, went up from 3.5% to 14.8%. You know, 11.3 percentage point jump in unemployment in two months. I guarantee you, Jeff, if, if you'd show numbers like that to an economist, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, and said, we're going to be hit with something like this in the future, you probably would have been laughed out of the room. You just can't do that. Now, so that's the bad news. The good news is that, you know, to a large extent, because of the nature of the shock, that it was this, you know, shutdown, lockdown, uh, run for cover uh, shock, um, you know, when things have opened up and with the monetary and fiscal support that governments and central banks gave the economy, which essentially to a large extent, kept the economy in a kind of suspended animation so that it was the patient was alive when it was ready to come out of the uh, intensive care ward, uh, the recovery has been quite quite V-shaped. Um, if I stick just to the US, um, the, the level of real GDP is now only about 1% below where it was at the end of 2019. So almost back to peak. Of course, if we hadn't had COVID, GDP would have been up about two and a half, maybe three percent in that period. So it's a it's a bigger loss. Um, but if you look, you know, everybody at the moment, and perhaps we can come back and talk about this a little bit later because I don't want to take too much time. But everybody's talking about the risk of inflation looming. We have you have job shortages. Um, we have inflationary pressures. Um, I'm not worried about that at all for reasons I can talk about a little bit later. We're still in a situation where there is substantial slack. Economists use these sort of anodyne terms like slack. What that means is a lot of people are still unemployed and a lot of people who would like to work more to rebuild their income and their wealth cannot do that. Let me just give you one number. Uh, the better measure of unemployment to look at in this period is is one that a lot of professional economists track, which is called U6. It's a measure of unemployment and underemployment. Pre-COVID, that was at 6.8%. It's always a little bit higher than the headline number. Um, that is That went up to north of 20%, but it's now 10.2%. So it's about, you know, three and a half percentage points above where it was pre-COVID. So at the very least, there's three and a half percent of the workforce that either want to work, can't find jobs, or want to work more. But a very worrying uh, statistic to me is, and I'll finish here, if you look at something like the labor force participation rate for high school graduates, people who only have a high school grad, uh, graduate, um, that fell precipitously, uh, about four percentage points or so, in the uh, due to COVID, and it's only recovered a little bit more than one quarter of what it lost. So that's, you know, this is where the real damage can be done longer term. Uh, you know, we kind of say to the labor market, but really what we're talking about to people's lives and to communities uh, where people have dropped out of the labor force and really cannot get back in. So I'm not in this category or this camp of saying, oh, the economy is overheating. Uh, let's start to tighten policy. I think that's far too premature. Okay. So we'll come. Thank you. That was excellent. We'll come to the, uh, the tighten policy or the things that work side of that. By the way, one note to add to that is the number. So this is a specifically uh, uh, U.S. thing, uh, but the number of people that believe. If you drive around, and I look for this regularly, there are restaurants that have signs up saying, we wish we could hire, but no one wants to work anymore. They believe that there are people now on various assistance programs that are doing better than when they had a job at the low end of the spectrum and it's causing a problem that the people that do want to hire can't. So an interesting point to come to. But, uh, John, we'll go to you next about uh, your thoughts on, and you can follow up from what Paul said about where. Well, I, I think Paul gave us an excellent summary of, you know, hard data. And um, I've, I've, I've sort of gravitated toward the social sciences and soft sciences, um, psychology, et cetera. And I think, 
one aspect of the, the recovery is, um, it, it's really psychological. I think, um, uh, we've, you know, we've been through a, a fairly, you know, high drama period, both politically and, uh, pandemically. And, um, uh, it's, it's really changed people's habits. You know, I, I, I work as an executive coach and a lot of the, uh, executives at, at tech companies that I coach, um, you know, they're still working at home and, um, it, you know, when, when I ask them, well, gee, when, when does the mothership want you guys to return to work? And they're like, well, we're tentatively talking about after Labor Day. Wow. Um, and, you know, so, so people's habits have changed. So that's, a, that's another wild card in this recovery. You know, I, I, and I'm probably a good example, but I, I noticed that, you know, for the first time in, in, in my recent life, I, I can see a, hard, a, a pathway to achieving net zero in my own in my own life. And and why is that? Because, you know, I went from flying more than 50,000 miles a year, going to conferences all over the world and so forth, to having, you know, one trip to Portland last year for, to speak at a conference the week before, you know, COVID shut down. And my driving dropped from, you know, 8,000 miles a year to three. And so, you know, and, I, and I'm not, maybe I'm a, I'm more introverted than extroverted. So I'm not exactly rushing to go back to what was normal. I kind of like the new normal. And um, it's been easier for me to balance my, keep my budget and so on and so forth. So I think the wild card is really psychological. You know, how long is it going to be for people to feel safe? Are they going to go back to how they were before? Are they going to change their habits? Um, I think that's, that's another wild card in terms of, you know, how much, you know, there, there's probably some pent up demand among consumers, but, um, you know, have we changed our habits? Uh, that's a, that's a huge one. I, I by the way, John, uh, uh, do the report on, uh, some of the new networks on travel, right? And will travel ever achieve recovery back to where it was? And just for the reason you said, because we have changed our habits, the answer is no. Business travel and international travel, which are the drivers of profitability, not people going on vacation, uh, are not going to be the same because of our habits. Um, Danny, let's go to you. Um, I don't want to go back. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know, I, I see the way is forward. And I before this session, I just for just for giggles, I went and I looked up the word economy. Right. And it says uh, wealth and resources of a country or region in terms of production and consumption of good and services. And I wanted to take production and consumption and wealth and resources totally within the context of value exchange. You know, as a way of like getting rid of currency, getting rid of money, because there's so many things, whether you're in a barter system or you know something for somebody or um, so, some other way of looking at things. Because in my in my world, um, I have people who are looking at deregulation. They want a clean break from all the pat answers. Right. And they've been cut loose. I mean, they've been given what a life jacket put out, put off the ship in the middle of the ocean. And it's like, don't worry, we'll come back and get you. Well, I'm not waiting. You know, I'm looking at people and these are data scientists, right, who have a, 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 a scientific approach to data. Let's clear that up. And it's like we don't care about recovery. We care about rehabilitation. Not going back to where we were with the same rules and this, you got to do this and everybody's got to be rich and you got to, got to, got to. It's just driving people nuts. They don't want regulations. They don't want preconditions. They don't want compliance. Everything is too restrictive, right? So we came up with this idea. Actually, I did, but uh, I would can't do this without my team. And it's like I was doing some research on Sumeria, right? Sumer. 
and all these cuneiform tablets. It's a big thing now, all the things they're discovering. And it's like alien beings came to the earth and they provided the missing link by mixing their genomes with, well, ape women, quote unquote, and ended up with human beings. This is where we are. But there's a legacy. There's a mythology there that, uh, from which monotheism derived. And I'm thinking, OK, not only did Nietzsche project this and saying revalue all values, but it's here. And how are you going to do that? So we decided to build a virtual world, right, where we have 100,000 tour guides of people who don't know how to acclimate to this technological world. God knows my mother has enough trouble understanding how to use a phone, right, or a computer. And I think a lot of people look at it the same way. It's like I'm not going back to, to the people who betrayed me, and I have no faith in my government. I have certainly no faith in the economic system. Now they want to allow her another 15% on what? So I don't blame them. I would, you know, go into a hole and pull it in after me. Because there's really no way for, for the majority of the people, at least in this country and, well, the northern hemisphere, which is kind of where I, I operate, that sees any hope. And I think that's good because hope is like a way of prolonging man's agonies. We need solutions, right? We need a, a different way of looking at things and a different approach. And going back to what we had before, now we're into non-fungible tokens. An idea sold for $18 million the other day. I mean, you know, look at what's going on. We tried to do this in Bhutan and it was like, okay, one of the first state sponsored cryptocurrency in Bhutan and we couldn't get it done. You know why? Because they live in the mountains and jokingly, I call them, you know, the Himalayan hillbillies. There's just no acclimation. They no no desire. They like the system the way it is. Everybody has nothing and they're fine with that. And it's not about, you know, who and he who ends up with the most toys in the end wins. It's like, Let's get rid of the toys now. And the older I get, the less I want. And I want something that's not being provided by this economy and or its quote unquote leadership. You know, I'll take Putin any day over what we have now. And it's like that's what people need. Face the hard facts. And enough of this coddling and taking care of the whole world and who has food and who doesn't have food. I don't want to sound like a, you know, a rascal or anything, but I can't do it. I can barely manage my own life. Probably a good place to stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but you hit on a, a fundamental human truth. Um, everybody's just trying to get along. Actually. Um, you are correct. People are just trying to manage their own life. Now you said we don't want recovery. We want what? What was your other word? Rehabilitation. Yeah, okay. So I think that's a really important point because recovery assumes we want things to go back to exactly how they were, and that wasn't actually working before anyway. Um, so I kind of agree with your point. And you said we need solutions. So, John, we'll go to you first. What I'm going to do is go one more round, and then we'll let you guys just, just open it up between the three of you. But, John, for this round – Rehabilitation, what do we want to get back to and what solutions? How are we going to get there? Let's talk solutions a little bit. But I'd like you guys each to comment on where do we actually need to go? Where, what are we trying to do? Because I happen to agree, and you guys don't have to, with Danny that recreating things exactly like they were before the pandemic is not a good solution. So where should we try to get to with economies? And what what is working or what do you think is going to work? Let's talk about recovery and solutions. So, uh, John, you start. Sure. Well, you know, I, I hinted at where I was going to go in, in my prior remarks with with uh, my my ability for the first time to see a path in my own life to achieving kind of a net, a net carbon zero, you know, lifestyle. And I think uh, with, with many nations and many um, multinational corporations and other businesses having commitment to um, have achieved net zero by 2050. Um, I think a lot of a lot of folks haven't really grokked the enormity of what they've actually committed to, much less have any idea of how we're, we're going to get there. But if if humanity would like to um, avoid 
the scientific probability that by putting the amount of um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere from fossil fuels that we're putting in every year, uh, we're most likely going to create a, a greenhouse out of the earth, which will make some or all of the earth's surface, you know, uninhabitable for human life as we know it. And so if, if we, if we would like to optimize the probability that our children and grandchildren are going to have the same magnificent experience that, you know, we've had um, living on this, this marvelous planet that's hurtling through time and space, um, we probably need to do something about it. The way we collectively address the uh, ozone hole in the in the nineties, and uh, I think the the transition to net zero is going to fundamentally transform the entire economic system from top to bottom. We're going to go from a fossil fuels based economic system to one that's based on renewable energy, hydro, wind, solar, hydrogen, possibly small nuclear, nuclear. And uh, um, so I think that that the magnitude, the enormity of that transition, and we're talking, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars, it's going to be driven by, it's already driven by folks like BlackRock who want to see companies, you know, transition plans to, 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 to net zero economy. So I think, you know, that's going to be um, an enormous an enormous transition. So it's going to be a it's going to be a redesign of the economic system, not not a uh, return or a, a rehabilitation. It's going to it's going to be a fundamental redesign. I think that is so important for people to realize because everybody is talking about recovery and looking backwards and saying how do we get back to what we had? And this is actually an opportunity in history, right? Uh, you always look for the silver lining, and the silver lining of what happened was it's an opportunity uh, to chart a different future, which I like both uh, uh, you and Danny are going that direction. Um, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, so um, so, so take it back to my, my sort of my area, um, of the, sort of the macro landscape. Um, I touched on this before, the, you know, the, the big debate and what people are focusing on more and more is this idea that, well, we've sort of had enough stimulus and now we're getting the inflation. So now it's time to pull back. And, you know, I, I think we need to uh, sort of question some of those frameworks, particularly the kind of the, the intellectual and the operational framework of the sort of macroeconomics. And we've heard a little bit about this at some of the sessions today. So people, for example, will look at, the massive amount of, of debt that's been issued by uh, sovereign governments. And then they'll look at central banks, you know, buying up a lot of that debt and saying, well, that's money printing, that's going to lead to inflation. Um, but, you know, a little bit of simple economics will tell you that, again, given that shock that we had to the economy and essentially to demand because people had to stay at home and, you know, as John was saying, we didn't take planes and we didn't drive much and we didn't spend much. Um, it's essentially a, a, a little piece of sort of macroeconomic arithmetic at the global level that um, if you suddenly have an increase in net private savings, that is people are saving more than people in aggregate are investing. And that tends to happen in a, in this kind of recession because governments did give the money to the people who lost their income because of the lockdown. That was a good thing. But of course, we weren't able to consume very much. So savings went up. On the other hand, investment fell. It's just um, a, a arithmetic that says that must be reflected and mirrored in a blowout in the budget deficit. So it's really quite misguided mm. uh, <clears throat> to look at budget deficits which have blown out and whip ourselves into a frenzy of concern and panic and you know getting morbid about the future no 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 that was that was necessary medicine nobody wished for covid but given what happened with covid this is what had to happen um so that would be my, my first perspective don't worry about about that overspending but look at the economy now and again it's it's a little bit um counterintuitive to me because we have a lot of people, a lot of economists, you know, saying, oh, job, you know, you mentioned, I think somebody mentioned it before, um, a lot of signs out saying we want, we want people to work 
um, and you know job openings are going through the roof. But as I mentioned, there's still enormous latent unemployment. So I think we're in a phase at the moment, which might last a couple of quarters, where there's kind of a bit of a mismatch. The economy as an engine is sort of getting cranked up again, and um, it's 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 a perfect match. We, we have. A, demand and we want employers who want to hire people and we have a lot of people who actually still need to come and want to come back into employment so again i think it's premature to worry about that um the other thing that i would just kind of emphasize and pick up maybe on john's comments to a certain extent um there would you know the economy let's say we get back to something that is this kind of normal and economists would regard that as sort of full employment whoever wants to work can work don't have to work, but they can find jobs. Inflation is under control. That is the purchasing power. The purchasing power of money is not being eroded. That's why we have central banks watching the inflation uh, picture. Um, the structure of the economy will be very different, as has been pointed out. The composition of demand and therefore the composition of supply to meet that demand will, will be quite different. Um, now, none of us has the crystal ball that says it will exactly, you know, we're not central planners, uh, thankfully, that can say, well, this is where we need to divert these resources. The thing as an economist I would just emphasize a little bit is um, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. That is, the market system works pretty well at generating innovation and growth and demand and adapting. It's an emergent phenomenon. Um, but it's, it's lousy and doesn't have in its job description worrying about inequality. So, or, you know, necessarily climate risk. Somebody else has to do that. The, the, you know, the government acting on behalf of society. So, I, you know, again, you, you hear these voices um, that may be uh, kind of, you know, are very, very negative about the stock market's up 25% relative to its pre-COVID peak. Uh, rich people have done very well in this in some experience. That's true, but I don't think the alternative is to say, you know, we want to suppress all of that. So we need to somehow figure out ways of, you know, horses for courses, markets are good at some things, let's not bottle them up, let's harness them. And if we're talking climate change and climate risk, that's not my area of expertise. But, you know, economists would always say, well, what about a carbon price? What about a price on carbon? Um, and then let the market figure out, you know, how to, how to operate given those constraints. So there are some solutions there, but let's harness markets, but let's also recognise that markets – just are agnostic about um, you know, inequality and wealth and wealth inequality, and that is a, a big problem. And I do think that you know, as we look back on COVID, um, you know, school closures and everything else, um, the people people who have really been hit by COVID are the people who coming into this were the least you know well off in society, and they've suffered the biggest hits. Um, you know, all of us sitting in our offices in front of our computers, knowledge workers, so to speak, with probably some decent degree of financial wealth have come out very well. But let's not forget, a lot of people have been left behind. How do we deal with that, but in a way that doesn't throw that baby out with the bathwater? I, I think you made a really important point about that indifference to the inequities, uh, really important. So uh, we've got about 11 minutes left. Um I would like to throw out there, but you guys just jump in, just have conversation. Um, government can have, versus Can I have a comment? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I feel left out. Um, you know, I like looking at things from a different perspective. And, and, John, I think you touched on it. You know, I'm principally I'm a forensic psychologist, right? I want to figure out. I actually, I came up with a better word the other day. And it's like uh, I'm an enigmatologist, right? I'm a puzzle guy. I put things together until I get them to work. If something, if a piece is in the wrong place and it doesn't fit, I don't push it into place. So, you know, I'm looking at things as like not the results, but which I hear you guys talking about a lot, but the effects, right? And how do I get to people? Well, I can tell you what I do with my people. First of all, um, it's, it's got to be, it's, got, it's all about motivation. I don't think anybody wants to work after having been off work because they can see what it was like to go to work. You know, I used to drive from Stockton to, South, to downtown San Francisco, and mama mia, you know, I had to be insane to do that every day. 
besides the fact that we're chewing up the walnut uh, orchards and everything and 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 what for what so somebody could make something off of zero prime i give i tell my people and this is our strict and hard fast rule if you're not having fun doing it don't do it that's got to be the primary thing when people i don't think anybody i know is looking for permission you have permission now to do work, to go and to, to you know, get tr in, in this trap of a mortgage, you know, tuition, uh, car payments, uh, living in a life situation you hate. And it's like, just cut me loose and let me have my own life. So I think it's a matter of correcting people's perceptions, correcting their way of thinking. And once they have a taste of freedom, forget it. They're not going back. And I think they're, they're scrounging to try and find a way to make a living like we did before, like my father did. My father was a blacksmith. You know, he, he found work. He didn't wait for a check to come in the mail. He made his own money and he did it with these, with his hands and with his head. And that is what I admire in people. Not the whole idea of how do I juggle this? How do I jostle that, you know, in order to get money? I would like to be fair with people and what the solution that I would like to provide and have made some pretty good inroads on it is um, what I call the perfect virtual world. I want to scoop up. I've got a hundred thousand data scientists who are willing to help everybody get in touch and apply their ideas in this new techno sphere, right? This cyber sphere we're living in. And that means it's a bottom up approach, not a top down approach. I don't want anybody telling me what to do and you know, I, I don't allow it. Whatever the hardship, it's like what life is supposed to be sitting on a couch playing with the something. I never look up to look at people anymore. I want my life back. And I think a lot of people do too, without being told what to do. And another of this and Washington says that and Moscow says that. And it's like, no, shut up, leave me alone. Let me live my life. And I'll take those ideas from those billions of people who don't have a voice and give them a voice and put this team together to say, you too can play. Right. And I think we'll find more answers that way from the disenfranchised, the little people than we will from, you know, what's on top. I really do. I got a lot of faith in, in the people who don't have a voice. You know, uh, Danny, it, it, it was most definitely one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that people yep. had an opportunity to gather with other people and share ideas in a way they never had before. We saw the true power Online. of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it right, but it was, it, was it was something we never did before that. Um, I think we just have a few minutes left, and I think what would be nice would be to let you guys each have uh, – a closing statement, uh, again, sort of forward focused. What do we need to do and what's going to work? Paul, why don't you uh, take two minutes? Each of you do like two minutes and that'll use the rest of our time. Um, but I think you guys hit on a lot of really important points today. It's not recovery, it's rehabilitation. We don't want to go back to exactly the way we were. And this is an opportunity to make change. So, Paul, why don't you sum up two minutes for each of you? Um, what do you think we need to do uh, going forward? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, you know, two minute challenge. That's a tough one. But, you know, I think what picking up on, on Danny's uh, point and his his area, um, you know, the, the one big trend that's emerged or one of the big trends emerged from this whole episode, of course, is sort of the digitalization, the virtualization, the information economy put on steroids. Um, and and that's an, that's an area where, you know, if, if you're a knowledge worker to begin with or if you've got skills in this area, you, you've done very, very well. Um but the more that we operate in that sort of virtual information world, um, yeah, we still have this physical world. And there's a whole lot of people that have to deliver those Amazon packages to our door and, 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 and so on and so forth. And a lot of those people, let's face it, are sort of, you know, they don't have the skill set. They maybe hopefully could acquire it to um, partake in that information economy in the way that we can. So I think one of, you know, in terms of what do we need to do, um, you know, it's a cliche, but skills 
upskilling, reskilling, um, education, and really equipping the people, or at least giving people the opportunity. Um, and I do, you know, I do, re- I do kind of what Danny says resonates, just handouts and money, you know, that tides you over for a few months, but we need to give people both the incentives and the opportunities to develop the skill sets that are going to be necessary in the future. And, you know, it's, again, as an economist, we, we, we hear this debate all the time about infrastructure, not enough investment in infrastructure. The infrastructure in the U.S. is crumbling. But what really strikes me as an economist is while all that's true, we seem to be living in a period in which there's this invisible infrastructure being put in place. Many of the people in this conference are engaged in that. Um, but it's, it's not something tangible, and it's sort of almost an economy that exists and operates outside that physical economy where a lot of people are being left behind. Excellent. Uh, and totally agree with you. Um, uh, because like you said, uh, we still do have to make stuff as well. So uh, integrating and maintaining those two economies. Um, John? Well, I've been... The, one of the silver linings for me with the, this whole COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis that ensued is just how quickly the collective of humanity changed its behavior. And and that's, for me, that's a, a very encouraging thing because as, as we, we human beings tend to be absolutely terrible at changing our behavior. Only one out of nine of us approximately has the uh, cognitive horsepower and the willpower to change our behavior uh, volition, you know, on, on our own without help or assistance or without a crisis. So I think what's, what's coming is a, a transition to a, a, a developmental civilization where, um, you know, Danny, Danny talked about fun. Well, I, I, I come at it a different way. Fun is a very positive emotion. And what, you know, the neuroscience shows is that when human beings work in environments where we're loved and trusted, we're twice as happy, we're twice as productive, and we have twice, our, our job tenures are twice as long as in the normal fear-based environment. And um, so I think there's going to be a transition from uh, fear-based leadership and fear-based environments to, to love and trust-based environments. And and uh, an emphasis on self-actualization, personal development, and the meta skill imparting the meta skill of lifelong learning and um there'll be also a transition from shareholder primacy based companies that exist solely to maximize profit for shareholders to entities that have a comprehensive social and environmental conscience multiple stakeholder models dual purposes and i think there'll be a shift from neoliberal economics to something like donut economics, where the rules of the economic system are are, are upgraded to reflect the uh, the fact that we need to base everything on care for each other and care for our shared planetary home. And those those are the the core foundational principles of the emergent developmental civilization. I, I love that, John. Um, a lot of positivity uh, there and where we can go from here. But I, I think that seems well uh, what all three of you said. And that's certainly an exciting uh, future if we uh, build it the right way. Uh, Danny, why don't you just take us home with the last couple minutes? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, I think what I'm hearing, well, I don't know if it's what you're saying, but what I'm hearing is we need to refocus. And when I'm refocusing, um, I looked at a couple of things that I think are primary. Uh, just recently, I, a physicist at the uh, University of Manchester said that information is a new, the sixth form of matter, right? So you've got this information which can be translated into binary code, and binary code can represent everything in the universe. It's mathematics. And mathematics is ruled by the second law of thermodynamics, which is heat exchange. That's what it's all about. And that leads to one conclusion of efficiency, right? That the amount of work that you do and where it's applied and what your intended results are on a personal level. On my, this is my life. I can't, 
I can't affect your life other than running my mouth. But uh, there's got to be a level of efficiency, not waste, right? And people start thinking about what needs to be done and applying it to their own life. And then, you know, once we get to actually talk with each other and stand close enough uh, to each other to, to feel some kind of physical presence, I think then, you know, we can get past it. And, be, and one last comment on COVID, and I, I don't want to sound, you know, too harsh, but 